Ahem, ahem. All right, now pull your finger out, Brilla, because uh, someone is watching. And I was a regular at uh, Hitchin Folk Club, and in fact, it was he who christened me Brillo. Because I was sitting in the audience with the big hair, and he said, See, Brillo, and the audience fell about laughing. And that was that. That, that was me uh, mainly Christian. for eternity. And you know that he would love to have jams with various people. So one night at Hitchin, just after I'd started at the Royal College of Music, I went along, played with him. He said, Here's my phone number, dear boy. Give us a call. And so I did. And then the first gig we did was, I think it was Chelsea Arts College or something like that. They had a folk club there. So I started with him there, then started playing around, went along to the Cambridge Folk Festival in 71 and ended up on the main stage with him, which was great. Uh, you know, all sorts of things like that. If you see me coming, hoist your window high. If you see me coming, hoist your window high. And if you see me going, hang your head and cry. Was Disley different when he played jazz and when he did his funny act? Uh, I think there was more concentration, but the funny act Again, if you, if you listen to your, your video of me and Diz at uh, Pinner Parish Church in 71, yeah. I remember that. Uh, you listen to his chordings, it's pure jazz chords. It's not just straight, you know, E, A, D, G, or whatever. And also his voicings, they're halfway up the neck. There, there's a school of jazz playing by people who don't know that thinks if you just play E7 shapes all the way up the neck, you're playing jazz. But in fact, the secret of jazz playing is you don't play six string chords. You'll play the top three or the middle four or whatever it might be. Yeah, triad, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so the voicings, and you can also imply voicings of advanced chords by not playing the root note, the, 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 the chord note, which you do on the bass. So that fills in the whole thing. And, so, and some jazz voicings imply a particular chord when the, the chord note is not actually there. So your ear sort of synthesizes that. So... I mean, Diz always used to like jamming at, at uh, clubs simply because you never know who might turn up. And, and I'm living proof of that, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, what were you saying about, Richard was talking about that Pinner Parish gig and drinking, drinking whiskey from a bottle. Right. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's uh, that. I won't forget that. I can't. You know, I can't even remember if we were playing at that concert. There was two. There was one with Diz, and there was one with Bridget St. John. Yeah, but I remember I, I came in and walked up the centre aisle towards the altar and sort of turned left and, not surprisingly, ah. met this coming the other way. Right. And he said, oh, you know, hello, Richard, how are you doing and what have you? And then he said, do you fancy a small tincture? <laughs> at, which point, at which point, out of his pocket, he drew a half bottle of scotch. No glasses, just a half bottle of scotch. Johnny yes. Walker, I remember it now. Now... Point is, I was brought up, as indeed Louis was, because he went to the same school, as a strict Catholic. And I thought, in a church. And then I thought, the other part of being a Catholic is that in those days, we were sort of taught if you even stick a, uh, stuck a big toe in a Church of England church, you know, you were down for hell and damnation. So I thought, may as well hung for a sheep as a lamb. So I yes. grabbed hold of the bottle and took a couple of good swings. I probably played well that night, which would be unusual. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's an important part of that's an important part of Disley, isn't it, uh, David? Um, well, yeah, he he used to drink a hell of a lot, and um, in fact, he he got away with it because he he. Um, I remember driving back from gigs with him where he was pissed as a fart, but he just sort of said, "All you do is you drive very slowly and carefully at thirty miles an hour, and you don't get stopped by the police." Now, supposedly, Silvo, do you remember Johnny Silvo? He got yeah, stopped yeah, once, yeah. yes, and he got pulled up, and he pulled his car up where one side of it was actually onto the pavement. And when the police opened the door, he actually fell out of the car. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes. No, uh, no Diz, Diz was just sort of very careful. He, he, he didn't go like a 
become a raving lunatic when he was when he was pissed. Can you talk about the relationship between um, Disley and Stefan Grappelli? Ah, uh, yes, yeah. Um, when Diz suggested getting the Hot Club quintet back, we went to see him. Uh, I forget where it was, but he was playing just with a piano trio. I, I think it was. was I know where there. it was, Dave. It was at Ronnie Scott's. Yes, yeah. I, I, I was trying to think who else was there, and I, you and I were there, and right. Ronnie came up to Diz because we were just sitting <laughs> listening and said, "Why don't you come back and goes back to meet Stefan?" And the next night, Disney went back and played alongside um, Grappelli at that at Scotts. Right. So that's that's when they sort of started playing then. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't do the very, very first um, gig of that tour. The bass player that Diz booked was Johnny Hawksworth. No, okay. um, yeah, but at the end of that gig, Johnny Hawksworth got into a punch-up with some guy over a woman. <laughs> yes, and, and, and injured his hand. And so literally, uh, you know, one day the phone rings and says, Brill, how do you want fancy working with Steph? And I thought, yeah, great, great, yeah, bring it on. Uh, because, and in fact, Diz told me about this, that um, Johnny Hawksworth was acting like a bit of a lunatic, so I stuck a mic as, um, right next to his bass so he was louder than everybody else and was sort of generally hogging the limelight. And according to Diz, Grappelli turned around to him and said, who is this? He is mad. And like, <laughs> yeah. So um, where was the gig now? I think it was um, at the Boggery in Solihull, Jasper Carrots Club that I did there and two members of Slade were along to listen and so we did that tour and that was fine. Now Grappelli was very fussy. He liked things to be just so. Uh, he had, had an argument about avocado pears in a restaurant, <laughs> would you believe? No idea why. <laughs> um, and, so, uh, and that was that. Now there's all the stories, I mean, you know, Diz, Diz was sort of went from one one sort of minor disaster to another and i think grappelli didn't like that at all i was, I was quite surprised when you said that uh that grappelli didn't like disney because he was wayward i mean if disney oh, no. was wayward, Django reinhardt <coughs> must have been a nightmare to play with ah right there therein lies a, a tale well it's i'm, I'm saying that, that disney is wayward because Diz goes his own way you know um you, you remember the fact that for something like 18 months, he was traveling the folk clubs because he didn't even have a guitar. Because you know, at one Cambridge Folk Festival, he, le he left his uh, Macca Ferry under his car while he went off to bonk a girl. And in fact, the particular girl I knew because I was at college with her. So he, when, yes. So, yeah. so when, he, when he went back to his car and looked underneath, somebody had walked off with it. And he found it in a... In a um, in an antique shop in in Belgium. West End Lane, no, in London, in West End <laughs> Lane, and bought it back for forty five quid. But he, yeah, but that wasn't the first time that sort of thing had happened. So for eighteen months, he was wandering around the folk clubs, and he would borrow a guitar from whoever was in the club. And supposedly one night he turned up, and there were no guitarists, so he was up a gum tree. <laughs> and then obviously you, there was a, a period where he would go along to folk clubs and he would arrive so late that he wouldn't do a first set or a second set. He would just do the second half of the evening. So he, he did get very unre unreliable. I mean, myself, when I was at the college, he'd say, I'll come and collect you at seven o'clock. And at 20 to eight, he would finally turn up. So his sense of time was, well, Diz used to run on Diz time. Now, <laughs> um, I, th I, th I, th I don't think it was that, that Grappelli sort of hated Diz. I, I, think, I think Diz admired Django so much that maybe, perhaps this is speculation on my part that he absorbed some of Django's own... Uh, Piccadillos? Yeah, well, yeah, or well, his approach to, to playing. I mean, there's, a, there's a, the well-known story, which I think Denny Wright told me about another jazz guitarist who went to Paris met Django at a gig, and Django said to him, oh, you're a guitarist, well, I've got this gig in Lyon or somewhere else. Uh, would you like to do it? Because I don't want to do it. And the guy said, well, yeah, but I haven't got a guitar with me. He says, oh, don't worry, go to the club, tell him I said you, there's a guitar down there. So this guy goes down to this club and said, oh, Django sent me, um, I'll do the gig. 
and he looked and there was this battered old guitar and the strings all had knots in them so they would broken <laughs> but instead of replacing the, the strings he would put knots in them and this guy was trying to play the guitar and it was impossible you know, to try moving his finger and boom, there would be the knot <laughs> Anyway, he, he managed to stagger through that. The next night, or a few days later, Django turned up, and, he's, and this guy said, well, I've got, to, I've got to watch this. And, of course, Django was tearing around this guitar with knots in the strings and everything else. Didn't matter. But uh, just to back to your, your approach about um, uh, Grappelli's opinion about Django, in the 50s, I believe, um, Diz wanted to bring Joseph Reinhardt, his, uh, Django's brother, to brother. London. And he's mentioned this to Grappelli, and supposedly, this is what Diz told me, Grappelli said, oh, you have nothing to do with that family, they are mad. <laughs> because you know, Django was the illiterate gypsy. It wasn't a question he couldn't read music. He couldn't read, period. Mm. You know, they, they were the very sort of you know, rough Belgian gypsies. Whereas uh, Grappelli, even though he came from a poor background, was very neat, very natty. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so you know, he liked things to be just so, I think he'd bought himself up by his bootstraps and liked being sort of um, very uh, sort of neat and tidy and organized and, and you know, moving up in the world. Whereas Django did, just didn't give a toss about anything. What struck me about this a lot was there were kind of two sides to him musically i mean he obviously started off with with jazz and when jazz in particular trap tra jazz was very big he was doing that and he was and playing then, banjo yeah a banjo to start with yes, yeah, yeah, yes, 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 yeah yeah but yeah. then when folk music became big he actually created a folk music act or oh, uh, yes music. He, he created an act for uh, for, for folk clubs. And I think he knew then that in folk music, it's very difficult to be really popular just playing the guitar because your, your audience so often is other, just other guitar players. So he developed a completely different act, very funny, with the brilliant guitar as well. And then after that, with Grappelli, he went back to probably what was really his first love. Uh, yes, but remember at one point he I think uh, there's there's one example that he played the Royal Festival Hall with Grappelli one night and then immediately after that went and did the gig, a gig at the Troubadour. <laughs> so literally he, he could switch from one to the other. The That's point the other. about yeah the, the point about Dizzy's folk club act is it, it's it's pure entertainment and pure music hall in, yes. in many ways. Yes. And so that was actually different from the usual thing of uh, uh, somebody who gets up with a guitar and sings songs and looks at their, their feet or just sort of looks miserable. <laughs> and this is pure entertainment. And that's a very important point that an, an awful lot of people Absolutely. still in the folk scene now don't realise that if people are paying to see you, you actually have to entertain them. You don't just sort of sit there staring at your shoes uh, and right. sort of mumbling into a mic and twiddling a guitar. Yeah, you've got to, you've got to come along and say hi, folks. This is welcome to the show. You don't just all go. Exactly. Well, you know, I, I've suffered from my art. Now it's your turn. Yeah. Well, he he knew how to entertain people. No matter how young a prune may be, it's always full of wrinkles. We may get them here and there. Prunes get them. A baby frets until it hears its mother's lullaby. But no matter how young a prune may be, you'll never hear it cry. Oh. About ten years ago, I interviewed Jeremy Taylor. Yes. And we were talking about humour. And I brought up the name of Diz. He had a stage persona. And the, the comic act he did was an act. It's in my book, you know. Uh, yes, it was funny if you, because it was in tune with the, with with recognisable characteristics of English life, music hall in particular, and he would make his his fun, his humour would make reference to uh, to reference points which the English could tune into. But it wasn't anything to do with Diz the man. We never knew he was a private person. I never knew. I kept wanting to say, well, the real Diz Disley, please stand up because you don't know him. And ultimately, what an audience wants is you. Will the real Diz Disley please stand up? Any comment? 
Right, that's a very perceptive observation. Um, I'm just thinking on the on the hoof. I don't think that's true uh, because Diz would have constructed this sort of humorous persona from his influences when he was younger and, and things like that. So he was a great fan, believe it or not, of George Formby. In 1988, I did the Jersey Jazz Festival. And do you remember Alan Randall? Yeah, he used to, used, yeah, he used to do a whole George Formby sort of bit. Um, and I remember Alan, Alan was very good. He was also a terrific jazz vibes player. And at that jazz festival, uh, Alan Randall was doing sessions with Martin Taylor, the legendary jazz guitarist. But Alan did his sort of stage show with, with doing the, the full uh, George Formby act. And I remember seeing Diz almost falling off his chair in hysterics. So that would be one part of it. It'd be some, the songs that he sang I suspect were from his earlier, more influential years. And so the WC Fields would have been a great um, sort of influence on him. So I don't think necessarily that, that this was a fake thing. It, it was just him working through his influences. So, you know, I remember George Formby, I remember WC Fields, I remember this, that, and the other. And the fact was that probably very few other people in the folk scene knew of that. So he could come along for them, that was fresh, but for him, that was his, Influences, just like, for instance, some of my influences might be Spike Milligan and the Goon Show. It's a generational, excuse me, thing. Mm -hmm. Does that answer well, your question somewhat? Yes, it does, because yeah. I felt that that was quite a, a severe um, criticism of him. And I'm not sure, uh, looking at him, I mean, I, I was a comedy script writer for a very long time. And to see the difference between the real comedian and the person who got up on stage was like Disley. You put on a coat and you become this funny person and afterwards. Most of them, I tell you, most of them take the coat off and they're miserable as sin. Yeah, well, Diz wasn't. <laughs> That's the thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah um, I mean, for instance, we'd be driving along, um, I think it was in his Rolls Royce, we were going to Uxbridge Folk Club. And sort of just out of nowhere, he just went, Uxbridge in finest WC Fields uh, you know, manner. Um, because he was obviously thinking of something. He was also a great fan of the Marx Brothers as well. <laughs> Although I don't remember him cracking Groucho lines or anything like that. <laughs> what he did do is he nicked a lot of stuff from um, uh, Ronnie Scott. And obviously from, you know, playing at Ronnie Scott's, you would have heard all of Ronnie Scott's uh, jokes and things like that. Yeah. So, like all of us, you know, you, you get a, a lexicon of jokes from various places. Now listen, all you maidens, about to choose a man. Don't get one who is ancient, grab a young one if you can. For an old man he is old, and an old man he is grey. While a young man's heart is full of love, get away, old man, get away. Now that is the Koran. Have you grasped it quite firmly, madam? He decided he would go to Spain because um, he'd met a guy uh, called Zamora who was building uh, a club. And he said uh, that uh, this builder, Zamora, actually built the club twice the size of the plans and got away with it. And the whole idea was, yeah, was to have this, this club there. And also Diz was saying, oh, it's going to be great living over in Spain because you could just sort of reach out and pick an orange off the tree and stuff like that. Now, supposedly where he went... Um, it was very arid, and also the electricity didn't work, so he was uh, planning to have everything run on 12 volts. Supposedly every time it rains in that part of Spain, all the, all the electricity sort of shorts out and things like that. But also, because it was very arid and dry, he got people to smuggle him earthworms from England. He got his chest, he put that in the earth, and they would, they would transform this sort of dusty dust bowl into some sort of garden. But of course... As soon as he stuck the, the worms in the earth, they probably roasted to death. And so that was that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, another, another story of Diz is I remember after one gig, we went to somebody's house and Diz was planning, I was talking about his master plan to drive his Rolls Royce across the Sahara. And they said, well, what are you going to do about water? He said, well, I'm going to take some great big sort of plastic tarpaulins and in, in the night dig a hole and in the night, the condensation will run down the tarpaulin, and so I'll have water at the end of the day. 
thank God that never happened. But, but this is a sort of uh, <laughs> quite extraordinary <laughs> thing. We, we, we talk you. about him as a fabulous guitar player and a great entertainer, which he was. I think he's one of the best entertainers, solo acts and yes. bass player that I've ever seen in my life. But he was also this amazing character. I mean, the yes. idea that a man like that can fall asleep during an interview for a job is just <laughs> really? extraordinary. Yeah, he was, he, he was, an, he knew he was an artist. Yes, he went for yes. a job with a cartoonist on the Radio Times and he fell asleep during the interview. <laughs> I, I don't think there's one person who was on the folk scene at the time that hasn't got a ridiculous story about this Disney. Of course, of course, yeah. It did strike me. In fact, I was looking the other day, in fact, I posted it the other guys, um, David Graham. Uh, David Graham had a, a little video, I mean, great player himself. And uh, he wasn't in his best days then. But even he, kind of three quarters of the way through, he's saying, well, I've got this story about Dis Disley. I know there's always stories about Dis Disley, but... And it was about shoving somebody in the dustbin. I don't know, it was crazy. <laughs> but, well, the, um, other thing, the other thing that Dis was renowned for was his cars. And yeah. one of them was a 1955 Cadillac Sedan de Ville. And the original owner, because it was in the logbook, was Paul Getty. <laughs> you and I, uh, yes, who, who, who gave his address as Savoy Hotel, London? Yeah, and um, this <laughs> this car was astounding um, because the boot was so large you could put my double bass and several guitars in the boots, and there was still room. You and, and I so, went to a gig together, and he had your bass and my bass both in the boot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can it believe was that it. cavernous. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Now, one thing happened that he, he, he crunched part of the wing, and so instead of getting it um, sorted, he actually drove it across the other side of the Finchley Road because he used to live in uh, Lincroft Gardens. And so he drove it over into Hampstead, literally dumped it, waited for somebody else to come and tow it away. Then the other one was the 1935 Rolls Royce um, uh, um, yes. shooting brake, which he bought for 250 quid from a guy in Cornwall. And that was quite amazing driving along in that because you see people driving past and they look at open their windows and look at amazement by that. <laughs> didn't he didn't he always carry a big bag of carrots and a juicer? Because somebody had told him ah, that uh, carrots. Oh yes. Juice. Oh yes, yes. Raw juice therapy. He was yes, he told me all about this. Yes, yeah, where you get you get a juicer. No, no, the I've, I've actually as a result of that, I actually investigated that and that the the, the technology or the thinking behind that is actually very sound. Um, it's getting fresh vegetables literally almost out of the ground. Get a juice extractor, drink the juice, and he cured himself of gout as a result of that because gout is caused by uric acid crystals in the joints. He told me all about this. And so he did that, and you pee away your gout, your uric acid, and so you cure yourself of gout. And, and he took great, yeah, he took great pleasure in telling me about, he'd, he'd explained this to other people and they all go, yeah, it's piss off. And they were the ones who ended up having to have the plastic hip replacements and things like that. Yeah, yeah a fount of knowledge. Talking about cars, there was one time where I heard a story that he had no brakes on the hearth. And every time he came to a red light, he turned left. <laughs> <laughs> and he got oh, well, the long way around. <laughs> right. oh, well, I've got a better one of that with, with no brakes, and I think it was another Rolls Royce. Supposedly he'd gone down a hill. It might have been the one in Portsmouth where um, he was driving along, there were no brakes, and so he pulled up, and the police were but behind him. And as, as, as the policeman came to the car, and the car drove to a halt, he pulled on the handbrake. And the handbrake broke off in his hand, at which point the policeman <laughs> opened the door and did said to the policeman, terrible workmanship. In the last years, I got, I got an MA in musicology just a couple of years ago, and I'm doing a PhD in music now. And over the years, I've done a lot more in jazz, um, all 
also uh, conducting the West Midland Light Orchestra. I did that for 10 years, which was like a recreation of the BBC radio orchestra. Do jazz standards, but orchestrated up. Anyway, so looking back on Diz, I thought, you know, he knew a hell of a lot more musically than he used to let on. And you can hear it in this play. So I look back and I just sort of think, wow, that was absolutely astounding. I mean, I did learn a tremendous amount. Um, but if I was if I was to meet him, if I was to go back 50 years, then I'd be able to find out a lot more because his playing um, was full of nuances and, and subtleties that only now I appreciate what was going on. 